Today we'll do a Octave tutorial, or we'll start with an Octave tutorial. Octave is a software for numeric computing. It's the open source equivalent to MATLAB. And yeah, there's also a package for symbolic computing, but, but usually it is MATLAB and Octave are used for numeric computing, whereas Mathematica is typically used for symbolic computing. Okay, so we will simply start with some basics. Okay, you already uh, could see I just start Octave from the command line in Linux. Okay, and of course it's also available for Windows. So I will simply start with some basics. One plus one, I just use it as a calculator and you already see here, you can see the answer or I can say x the variable is one plus one and I will see the answer x is two. In order to suppress output, I just add a semicolon and now x is stored, but you can see the output. And this is also important when programming with Octave because uh, you add a semicolon after each term and if you want to debug, you just remove the semicolon and when executing the program, Octave will print out the value of the term. Okay, uh, there are also, uh, of course, a lot of built-in functions like uh, sign, for example, the sign of, oops, of, and constants like pi, pi, half, and then I have one. And you can always do the following help sign. Help sign and then you see, okay, compute the sign for each element of x in radians. So you see we can also pass a matrix. Typically we can, you can pass matrices, matrices to uh, functions and then the functions, function will be computed on each element. And what we did right now here, p half was just treated as a one by one matrix. Okay, these are the basics which you need. We start now with vectors and matrices. Uh, I will s define a simple two by two matrix. Um, A equals, this is done with squared brackets, one, two, and I mark the beginning of the new row with a semicolon, three, four, and now I have this matrix, okay? And the same, I do a bigger matrix for what, we, what I want to show you next, five, six, <coughs> seven, eight, nine, and this is now a three by three matrix, okay? And now I can access single elements of this matrix with brackets, for example, the seven, which would be the third row, comma, the first column is the seven, okay? I can also change elements, of course, for example, A, three, comma, three, the last element is, uh, say, 17, and you see here, I changed the element, I changed the element of this. I changed this element of the matrix. Okay, we might also extract submatrices or vectors out of this matrix. Okay, so let's say I want to extract this submatrix sub -matrix here, this two by two submatrix here. Okay, so I will say A, and now I say which uh, co uh, which rows I want to extract. The first two. This is done by a colon one, two, two, comma. Okay and the second and the third column, so two up to three. Okay, and you see now I extracted this matrix and I could say B equals uh, this, for, ex for example, B equals, then I have the new matrix B, okay? And this of course can also be done with the, for example, if I want, let's show A again, if I want to extract uh, just the, sec the, the vector in the middle, the two, five, eight vector, this would be done by A, and then uh, all rows, comma, and the second column, okay? And if you want to take all, you don't have to say one, two, three, you just add a colon, that means all of them, and we would have the vector in the middle. Okay, and for example, if you have, you know all, you all know our system AX, AX equals B, okay? If you want to solve, for example, such a system, Let's define a vector B equals um, yeah, two, five, eight, for example. Um, the problem now is um, it will be, it is a line. Uh, this is a row. Uh, we want to have a column vector. We just uh, we would have to add these semicolons again here. Okay. Or what we also could do, we could just transpose it with some by, the by an apostrophe. Okay. Uh, one thing I have to say that I forgot to mention, uh, 
if you can't follow, it's, it's just okay if you just uh, understand what I'm doing. Uh, there's a text file where you can download all the instructions I'm typing now, okay? So you don't have to write down, or you don't have to remember everything. Okay, we defined a vector b, okay? And if we have ax equals b, we want to know what is x. Well, it's the inverse of a times b, okay? So we can compute the inverse. This is the inverse of a. You see, which, which takes us very long with the methods of Gilbert Strang, which, which he learned as is going very fast with octave. And inverse of x of a times, times the vector b is this vector. This means if I now multiply, uh, this is my vector x, okay, for example. And now if I uh, multiply this vector x by the matrix, I should get the vector b again, 2 phi phi, 2 phi phi. Okay? This sums simple computing. Um, the transpose, I already showed you the transpose, it's done with the apostrophe, transpose, okay. The inverse, we also have already seen the inverse. Yeah, with the transpose, you remember, this was what was the row here is now the first column here, okay. Uh, you can also s uh, compute the determinant, determinant of A. It's minus 24, it's not zero, so it's not singular. And there are uh, tons of built-in functions which you can use. Um, okay, what do we want to do next? Yeah, we can try an illegal operation. For example, x, we have the vectors x and b, okay? And it's not possible to, for example, to multiply x with b. Operator in unconformant arguments, of course. Yeah. So, but this might be a possible x times b and the result is a uh, one by one matrix or uh, x, x transpose times b or x times b transpose, for example, then the result is a three by three matrix. Okay, so um, my, uh, Octave is also checking if you are doing uh, illegal operations. Then we can do element-wise operations. For example, we have vectors 1, 2, 3, A is 1, 2, 3, and B equals 4, 5, oops, I forgot the squared brackets, 4, 5, 6, okay? And if I now try A times B, this is not possible, okay? But if I do this operator, before the, the, the dot before the operator A times C, then this is possible, okay? So you see, now it's uh, doing the operation element-wise, 1 times 4, 2 times 5, and 3 times 6, 4, 10. 18, okay? Okay. <coughs> and this is, of course, also possible with the matrix. For example, A equals 1, 2, 3, 4. This is my matrix, and then I can square this matrix. Okay, this is A times A, but I can also do this square element wise and then I will s I see these elements are squared now 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 4, 9, 16. Okay, so these are element wise operations. And the last thing with vector and matrices is uh, to create special vectors or matrices. For example, I can say x is a vector from 1 to 5. Okay? Or I can say 1, 2, 5, but with the steps of 0 0.5. Okay, and then this will be filled out with this with the steps here. We will need this when we uh, when plotting something, when plotting a function, uh, which we will sh see later. And then there are a few special matrices which you can produce. For example, A equals zeros. <coughs> two. This means two by two matrix of zeros. Okay. I can also say two by three matrix of zeros. Okay. Or I must say a matrix of ones, okay? These are zeros and ones are just creating special matrices. And of course, of course, this can also be done with an identity matrix. For example, this is done with I. I is creating an identity matrix, for example, a four by four identity matrix. You can use this very often, for example, if you need a, a matrix with a, uh, all the diagonal elements being five, then I just say uh, five times I 
4 and I will have this matrix which I need, okay? Yeah, the last thing with uh, vectors and matrices is uh, the size of a matrix. We have A, which is this identity matrix, and now we say A. Uh, the size of A, <coughs> which returns a 2 by 1 matrix, a 1 by 2 matrix, 4 and 4. And we can also, of course, access these elements of the size again, for example, like that. Okay? So this is all for uh, vectors and matrices so far. So the next thing is 2D plotting. We want to plot some function, okay? So first what we do is x equals, we produce a special vector. Minus 2 times p up to 2 times p with the steps of 0 dot, well, let's say 0 dot 1. And we don't, want, we don't want to plot this vector because it's so big, so we add a semicolon, okay? And what we can now do is to, s to produce a new vector y is the sign of x. This will produce a new vector which is with the same size of x and we don't want to plot it. We add a semicolon again. And now we want to plot it, the graph, the function plot x comma epsilon. This is all we need to do. Okay? And we have a nice function. Uh, another thing we might do, okay, it's that is the cosine, cosine of x. And uh, we might, might plot uh, x and z. Okay, we see now the cosine function, but the bad thing is the sine function. Maybe we want to compare to the sine function and this is gone. So how to do that? So we first plot the sine again and then we say hold on. It will be plotted again. And then we say, okay, and now we can compare them. They are both blue, which is not so nice. We can say plot it Red. Okay? Nice. And there are a few uh, plotting uh, functions in an octave uh, which I tried to summarize. Um, we can re reset all the plots we did so far with close all, okay? <coughs> and I'm showing you again what I did. Um, we can say, say we, we, want to, we don't want to plot the line, we want to plot red axis, for example, red x, okay? So you see now it's plotting red axis or green circles, green, oh, okay? These are not green circles, okay? This is, you plot typically like that if you're plotting, uh, if you're not plotting a function but uh, data points, for example, which you want to, where you want to approximate a function for. Okay. So, I will show you some further functions to, to manipulate a plot. So, close all. And I say hold on from now on. Now we have an empty plot. And we produce a new data vector. Let's say from minus pi to pi with very small steps. Zero, zero, one, we don't want to print it on the console. Okay. And now we plot, for example, x, and we can directly type here in sine x, sine of x, since sine is doing the, L, uh, the operation on each element of the, of the vector. And now we can add, for example, as a further instruction line with 2. Okay? And we have this beautiful sign. And we do the same with the cosine. We do it in, uh, in red, for example. Okay? And we have this beautiful function here. And what we do now is the following. Uh, we, s we can see that uh, the range, the range starts at, uh, the plot starts at minus 4 and 4, okay? And maybe we want to start it from minus pi uh, and uh, we want to plot up to pi. And you can see the aspect ratio is not one. Uh, with, uh, here what, uh, what is one unit in, in the x-axis is uh, only a quarter unit in the y-axis. And there are many functions you can manipulate. Uh, 
where you can manipulate this, but the most easiest one is with the a command axis, okay? So I say axis, and now I say the range where I want to plot in x from minus pi to pi, okay? And from minus one to one in, in from minus pi to pi in x and from minus one to one in y. And now I can say the aspect ratio, ratio. I can simply add it here, like equal, for example, like this, okay? And now this is the really the, the correct plot. Well, typically you won't do an equal an aspect ratio of one when plotting trigonomet trigonometric functions, but just to show you how this works, okay? Uh, you can you could all, instead of equal you can add uh, square, for example, then it will be squared, or you can add normal here. Uh, normal, then it will look like, uh, which octave means is the best fit, but let's do it with equal. Okay. Um, yeah, we want to know which function is which, uh, so we add a legend, legend, we started with the sine and then with the cosine, okay, and you can see now here we have the sine and cosine, and maybe it's not, uh, we can see maybe it would be better th uh, to put it here, okay? And now I show, you, therefore I will show you some functions, uh, a further function t to manipulate a plot. This is the so-called set function with set and with GCA, which means get current axis. You can manipulate the whole plot, for example. Uh, we can say key pos. Don't ask me why it's key pos. It should be legend by, well, to put it in two. And now we see now our legend is here. Okay, now this looks very fine. And of course you can access, um, you can manipulate, uh, there's a whole range of parameters, for example, like X grid can be put on on. Okay, and uh, let's do this for the Y grid too. And then we have a grid now, and you see we have a more and more beautiful plot. And at the end we just add the title Octave demo plot. Okay, we have the title here, and you can also add an X label. Let's say I don't know uh, unit circle and a Y label, for example, should be trigon function. Okay, and all this is ready. Now we have a really beautiful plot. Okay, we have labels, we have a title, we have a legend, we have everything, we have a grid. We want to plot it now to a file. Now we simply say print minus. What was this GCA argument in the Get current axis. This is the handle of the current axis. Uh, Which axis? Of the of our current plot, so to say. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. And, and the key pos, what, it, what was the two? This is Don't the... you have to give it two arguments, a x and a y position? No, this is the uh, quadrant. So... Ah, can you show it in the... Oh, I have to plot again. No. So, this means one, two, three, oh, four. Oh, you, you just can say in which corner yeah. the plot yeah. is. And uh, with help axis, you have, it's, it's uh, somewhere it's explained, but I don't find it now. Yeah, okay. okay, we want now to print it to a file, minus D, for example, in PNG format. Um, de oops. Demo plot dot PNG. Okay. So we Print, plot it again, print it, and now we take a look at the system. Okay, and you see we have a very beautiful plot. And we can publish this in a paper now. Okay, so that was 2D plotting. And I'll show you now how to define a function. Um, I have you know who is inside. 
we want to define a function sigmoid dot m. Okay. <coughs> okay. So how is this done? Sigmoid dot m. This is done uh, in the following way. You say a uh, function, and then the value we want to return, let's say s, is sigmoid of an argument x, for example, and then here end. And here we now have to manipulate s. Yeah, well, maybe it would have been better uh, to say sigmoid s is a function of x. Uh, it would be, from my point of view, more intuitive, but well, th that's the way li like it, how it is defined. So another thing is you can use uh, Octave as a, it's a normal programming language. You can program in Octave, okay? So maybe we want to implement it in the same way like they implemented the built-in function sin, sine or cosine. So to compute it for, all, for any element in a matrix, okay? So for example, a simple, so a simple way to do this would be, I will show you, uh, Let's define here a capital S and a capital X. So to denote a matrix, uh, for example, we might first look how, uh, what is the size of our matrix, okay? Size of X is MN, okay? And now S will be of the same size, so we will initialize an S a resulting matrix of the same size. Uh, we will fill it with zeros, zeros MN, okay? And now you can do loops, like in every programming language, for i is from 1 to mn, first the rows, okay? And then, for example, for j equals 1 to then the columns, okay? And we end this, oops, we end, come on. Um, this a question about this mn. Yeah. I mean, if x is a matrix, then mn is a vector consisting of two numbers, yeah. the width and the height of one. Yeah, I showed that at the beginning when we did matrices and vectors. Yeah, I know, yeah. but okay. I mean, this mn is not a number, so the structure, the data structure of this mn depends on the dimension of this uh, variable x. Yeah. It may be a, a number, it may be a vector, it may be a matrix, it may be even higher than Yeah, that. but even a scalar is treated as a <coughs> one by one matrix. You see, okay. size one is one one here. Size one mm -hmm. is, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh, okay. So it's, oh, but. Yeah. Um, you can have numbers, vectors, and matrices, but not like in Mathematica, a tensor of third order or something like that. Oh, I, I'm not sure, but I, I think this is possible. Didn't we try something like that in the AI uh, course? Oh, I don't know. In KI Practicum. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. okay, and now we want to compute the sigmoid function for each element. We are iterating over each element and we say now S. S is our resulting matrix, which we defined here, i comma j equals, and what is sigmoid? 1 divided by 1 plus e to the power of minus x, and now this position here. And we want, if I, uh, do n if I won't add a, a semicolon here, then this value will be printed out whenever this code, this line of code will be executed, okay? And now we'll store it. Okay, and let's go back to MATLAB, uh, to Octave. And now if I type in sigmoid, tap, tap, I can already call this function, okay? But I don't know why with M. Normal is das nicht so. Well, let's try it. This value should be nearly one, or okay, and <coughs> minus five should be a very small value. Okay, and A is now, let's test, check it. Come on. Let's check this. Uh, minus five should be a very, this a small uh, value. 
zero should be the zero dot five and plus five. This let this be our matrix or our vector. And now it's the sigmoid of A, and you see this is correct. Okay. So this is how you might define a function. And if I, we could check, test it like we could do the following, go from minus 10 up to 10 with the steps of 0, 0 0.1, don't plot this, and now plot x, the, sig the sigmoid of x, and so that everybody can see it with a line width of 3. Oh. And I should first close the old one. Okay? And we have a very beautiful sigmoid function. And I implemented it the way I did in order to show you how you can program with Octave. But you, this, the whole stuff here can be done much more simple. And it is typical that in Octave, uh, they are always, how to, so to say, uh, easier implementations uh, where you have to think in a mo maybe more mathematical way. So where you can do matrix operations in, in s instead of uh, yeah. loops or nested loops, you should do it. But there's also another uh, a nice possibility to implement this. We can do, I showed you the element-wise operator, okay? So I un uncommented all the stuff I had below. Oh, let's, let's delete it. So we say the matrix S is 1 divided by element-wise, 1 plus element-wise, E over element-wise, awakes. Okay, that's all. And we go back, plot, and we have still the same function. Okay, so this does, the single line does the whole job. So if there is a matrix in the term, you have to do each operation element-wise. Okay, so this was how to program and how to define a function in Octave. And the last step is plotting in 3D. I'll show you how to do this. Close our... We use the function MeshGrid. I will show you what MeshGrid does for us. X dot Y equals MeshGrid. And now I say from 1, 2, 3, comma from... One, two, three, and you see the X is a matrix where uh, a three by three matrix, and the element of the column is always the position. Okay, and the same goes for Y, but for the rows. And with the help of these two matrix matrices, we can now plot, make a three D plot. Uh, I will, yeah. I will go from minus 4 to 4, the steps of 0 0.2, and from here to, to 4, and the steps of 0 0.2, and we won't plot it because it's a, a huge, big matrices. Okay, and now I can already say a matrix set equals the cosine of x plus the sine and let's say 1.5 times y. Is it y? Yeah. Okay. And we will now plot this. Is it mesh x y z? Okay. And now you see a beautiful 3D mesh of this function. Okay. So the mesh, the function mesh grid is. Uh, which uh, created the, the basic matrices we used to compute this, uh, over which we computed this function. Okay, you can also do a surf, which is surface. Okay, it's not the mesh anymore. Uh, I don't know why it seems to be rendered by software, not by GL, I don't know. It's very slow, but you can also plot the surface of that. And so Richard, uh, for, for this one dimensional uh, um, vector with x values, you just specify the, the interval. But for the two dimensional, it, you have to use the mesh grid command. Yeah. 
Okay. Because I have X and Y, y. in my function. And we can also do a contour plot of Z. So this is the contour plot. OK. So just to remind you, this was the mesh. And the contour plot is like, uh, like this, looking from, from the Z direction onto, in the, neg in the negative Z direction onto the plot. Okay. Again, um, this, so what you did with the mesh grid command? Yeah. Um, does this mesh grid command produce a matrix, or is it something? Two two matrices, x and y. Okay, this x here and y. And you see in x, I have always the position of the column in each row. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Okay. Oh, and. If I'm now computing Z is cosine of X and Y, then it is computed uh, like this. It, it is in this position, for example, uh -huh. it is looking for the Y position, it's 3, and the X position is 2. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Okay. And, okay, we had the contour plot, and this means that each line here is one specific height in Z, but we don't know which one, which head. So we add a color bar color bar. Okay? So, now we have a color bar and we can see, okay, here is red, here is yeah, dark red or brown and this means we have here a value of 1.7. It is more than 1 because we added the cosine and the sine. Okay? And there is another possibility you can do. You can say surface and you will have oh, this looks weird. Usually this should look different. It looks the same like, well it's a similar plot like um, like a contour but this uh, the color should be filled out now. There's some kind of error. I don't know, maybe a bug. Okay, so that was, this is also, that was vectors matrices plotting to the in 3D and defining functions and programming in Octave. Okay, any questions? Okay, so... There's a way to plot the, the line and also the uh, mark. Sorry, the? A line, plot a line and also the mark. Like the circles or Yeah. Yeah, this might be possible if you um, if we do it like that, for example, and First, plot the line, a red line. Okay, and then we might plot maybe this works. Green axis over that. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you can see the green axis. Let's make blue circles. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Before I continue uh, about sequences and series, um, I guess I forgot to say you a few words about the practical use of Mathematica. Uh, so first is, 
Um, it is installed in the Linux lab over there, so you can use it on uh, each one of these PCs under Linux. And uh, second, um, I forgot to tell you that apart from the command line interface I showed you last time, there is a graphical user interface for Mathematica. So for all those who prefer to work with the mouse rather than with the keyboard, uh, you can use the graphical user interface. I don't like it, but uh, it's up to you. Uh, and uh, so if you call it from Linux, maybe you have seen uh, the command line interface can be invoked with just typing in math, M-A-T-H. But if you type in Mathematica, then you get the graphical user interface. Huh? And also uh, in the Rechenzentrum, there is a lab uh, with Mathematica running on the PCs. I don't know in which room it is, but you will find it out. Um, yes, I think that's enough about Mathematica. Okay, yeah, so now let's continue with uh, sequences and series. Um, so now, uh, first, uh, what is the difference between a sequence and a series? Oh, where is the pointer? Oh, over there. A series is just a, a sum of the uh, first n elements of a sequence. So let a n be a sequence of real numbers, then the, the sequence of the partial sums of these partial sums, look, I take the elements of a sequence called a, a k and I take the sum k equals zero up to n of these sequence elements, so I take the first n, the sum over the first n elements of the sequence, and uh, now, now I get a new sequence. Now I get a new sequence Sn. Uh, Sn, which is the sequence of the partial sums over our series, uh, sorry, the sequence of the partial sums of our original sequence. A k, and this is now called a series. Yeah? Um, and we get an infinite series because, of course, we can uh, make this n as big as we want. Yeah? Um, okay. And yeah. And now we c we may write something like this: sum over k equals zero to infinity a k. Yeah? But I mean. Yeah, this is kind of critical. We, we do have an infinite sequence A, 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 N. Huh? Infinitely elements of our sequence, like um, one, two, three, and so on. Huh? So this may be our sequence A, N, just to take an example. Huh? Now I can talk about the series of the partial sum. And then I take this sum over k equals zero to infinity a k. But why is this critical in this example? Or may, may I ask an easier question? What is this? This is equal to what? Infinity, yes. So the result of this sum is not a number. Huh? It's infinity. And therefore, writing something like that doesn't make sense if, if the sum is not finite. 
and therefore um, maybe now uh, you can understand um, why this term is defined like that I mean just forget this left part just look at this part here this is a finite sum sum k equals 0 to n a k so this would be here uh, as an example um, if I write sum k equals 0 to 5 a k is then some finite number which is 6, 10, 15 so here everything is easy and fine and finite it's nice yeah? so and even if we take an arbitrary n here everything is fine and well defined and that's why it's no problem to write this sum k equals 0 to n a k this is well defined all the time and now we can put the limit n towards infinity in front of this and ask ourselves does this limit exist and if this limit exists then this left hand side is well defined so if you ask yourself what is this then you know it's nothing but the limit of these partial sums for n towards infinity okay here we have a couple of examples this example which is the first look n then our sequence a n and uh, the finite series um, no sorry the, I mean the series is infinite but each s n is a finite partial sum so here we have a finite partial sum and so on um, but this series does not converge there is no limit for n towards infinity okay so now let's talk about um, series that converge and here we have an example let's take this sequence one, one half, one fourth, one eighth so this is the one over two to the power n huh? this is a geometric sequence and now if we take the, uh, the, uh, the corresponding series which is the uh, corresponding geometric series uh, so if we take the sum of all these terms up to here then this is the sum or the sum of all these terms up to here that's what we get and uh, written as a decimal number that's what you see here and it looks like it converges to 2 and that's actually true okay now uh, quite often we have a series and uh, we want to decide whether the series converges or not uh, um, and there are a couple of convergence criteria which I just shortly mentioned we, we don't do uh, too many proofs about this um, I hope you had this uh, earlier um, okay now there is this Cauchy uh, convergence criterion uh, that uh, so for a series in order to converge it requires this for all epsilon greater than zero there exists an n such that uh, this sum here must be less than epsilon and look at this sum that's very important k uh, goes from m to n uh, so we start at a certain index m and sum up all the elements up to another index n and uh, so the series converges if this condition holds for all epsilon and all n and m bigger than this capital N 
uh, yeah. And why is this called the Cauchy convergence criterion for uh, series? Because it is based on uh, the definition of a Cauchy sequence. Huh? So maybe, maybe we should talk about Cauchy sequences here. Yeah, I guess we should do this now because then we don't we don't need it. We, we will we will need uh, Cauchy sequences anyway later on. So, but maybe we should put the light on here. Or no, no, maybe we look into the script and I tell you at which page we find it. On page 97 on the bottom, you will see definition 5.6. Yeah. Okay, here we have the definition of a Cauchy sequence. This is the definition of a Cauchy sequence. And I hope you remember the definition of convergence of a sequence. Huh? That's what we had last time. Maybe we should write down what we had. Um, a sequence A n converges to a limit A if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N of epsilon such that for all N greater than or equal to capital N, A N minus A absolutely is less than epsilon. That was the definition of convergence. Um, and now you may compare it with this. I hope you wouldn't say, okay, this looks uh, as cryptical as the other thing does. Um, I hope you say, okay, that's as easy as the other one. Um, I explained this on this graph with the sequence and uh, there was this two epsilon ribbon around the limit and uh, so from a certain n on so if for all n to the right of this capital N all the elements of the sequence have to be in this two epsilon ribbon huh? okay so that's the understanding of this here um, and you can use this definition in order to prove that a sequence converges. If, if you can prove that this condition is fulfilled, then you have shown that your sequence converges. But there is a problem. The problem is that in order to use this definition, you have to know the limit, A. Because, I mean, you have to show that this, this um, difference here 
absolutely is smaller than epsilon. And how can you compute an minus a without knowing a? This is not possible. So that's a real problem. Uh, and, and this problem quite often occurs. You have a sequence, but you do not know whether the sequence converges. If you don't know that it converges, you typically don't know the, the limit. Yeah? Typically, or quite often, you have no idea about the limit. If you have no idea about a possible limit, you cannot apply this definition. No? And now look at uh, this Cauchy sequence. And that's the, that's the reason why we really need uh, Cauchy sequences, because in order to prove that a sequence is a Cauchy sequence, you don't need to know the limit. Now look at this. A sequence is a Cauchy sequence if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N. So it starts in the same way here. And now, such that for all N greater than or equal to capital N, and now we have for all N and for all M. Huh? A M minus A N is less than epsilon. And maybe we should now draw uh, this picture again. N and here uh, we have our sequence A N and uh, now we don't know a limit but we have such a, um, a ribbon and the width here this width here is epsilon and from a certain n on, so our elements may do something like that. And now, um, yeah, this is our capital N. Is that what we have? Yes. is less than epsilon. Look, maybe we could even put one here and one there. Our sequence converges if from a certain n on the difference between, let's take this uh, n and this m. And now the vertical distance between these two guys is smaller than epsilon. But what's very important, this must hold for all pairs n and m, for all of them. So no matter whether I use this and that or this and that, it must hold for all. Huh? And also what is not sufficient, what would not be sufficient would be to write a m or n plus 1 minus a n is less than epsilon. This is not sufficient for convergence. I have shown you an example last time. What was the example? I gave you an example of a sequence where this holds, but it does not converge. What was this example? Yeah, it was the logarithm. If we take log n, then for n towards infinity, log n plus 1 minus log n goes to 0, but the log diverges. And that's why we need to have this condition for all n and m to the right of our capital N. Okay, so now we know what's a Cauchy sequence. 
And now let's look at, let's go back and look at our um, Cauchy convergence criterion for series. Yeah. Look at this um, at this proof. Let S P be the sum of K equals zero to P of A K. So this is actually the partial sum um, number P. Huh? So the sum of the first P uh, P plus one elements of our series. Um, yeah. Oh, this of course has to be an E, not an A. Then, as n minus, as m minus one is the sum k equal m to n of a k, and that's what we have here. Oh, unfor oh. maybe it would have been better. I would have written down the Cauchy sequence criterion here. So, okay, so now we write Cauchy sequence AN, N, comma, M, Cauchy sequence if this holds. Okay. So, this criterion is just to show that the sequence of the partial sums is a Cauchy sequence. Huh? So, what, what do I need to do here? And now I'm, of course, talking about a series. So I, I have to use not the AN, I have to use SN, SN, SM. And what is SN? SN is the sum K equals zero to N a K. Okay? And now if I look at what we have here, is equal to uh, the sum k equals zero to n minus, uh, sorry, of uh, a k minus the sum k equals zero to m, yeah. And this is, I mean, here I take the first n elements of our sequence a k, oh sorry, a k, and here I take, I subtract from this sum, the sum of the first m elements, so this is absolutely the sum over k equal um, to, oh no, I take here. Yeah. I'd better take m plus 1 here. I mean, this is no problem, because I can take any m, so I can also take m plus 1. Um, so this is the sum over k equal m to n of a k. Huh? Or is that correct? No. I have to take m minus 1 here. Yeah, that's what I, what I need to do. Okay, 
And now look at this. This here is exactly what we have here. So our series converges if for all epsilon greater than zero, uh, there exists such a capital N such that this condition holds. And this condition to hold is nothing but this condition. Yeah? And this is Sn minus Sm. So for our series, we have to show that are the partial sums, uh, the sequence of partial sums is a Cauchy sequence. That's what we actually do here, and that's why this is called the Cauchy convergence criterion. Okay, ah, and I forgot, of course, to tell you something. Um, that, I mean, what we had on page 97 was just a definition of what a Cauchy sequence is. Okay, that's just the definition. And of course, uh, so if you are still on page 97, on the very bottom there is this theorem 5.6, which says, in the real numbers, every Cauchy sequence converges. That's, of course, a very important theorem. I mean, here I call it a theorem. Actually, it's not a theorem. Um, it is actually the construction of the real numbers. That's very nice, isn't it? I mean, what are the real numbers? The real numbers are, are not real at all. The real numbers are an, an invention by mathematicians. I guess, I don't remember who was it. Uh, maybe someone knows it. I guess it was Euler or Gauss, one of these famous mathematicians who said um, the natural numbers they are given to us by God. So they just exist naturally. And anything else, for example, the real numbers, is just an invention by us humans, mathematicians. Uh, and what is the, the set of real numbers? I mean, we start with the natural numbers, one, two, three, and so on. And then we construct the uh, rational numbers. Why do, why do we invent the rational numbers? Yeah, because we want to do something like division. Yeah? I take this one cake and divide it into three equal pieces, and that's what we then call one-third. Yeah? And we write it like one over three. Yeah? That's just the definition. Yeah? Okay, now we have these uh, uh, rational numbers, but, uh, and we can approximate almost everything we need. But there is no square root of 2 in the rational numbers, for example. Uh, there is no rational number which, if you take the square of it, the result is 2. Uh, there is no such rational number. Okay, now how do we get the square root of 2? Yeah, we need to define an even bigger set of numbers. and. Um, I already showed you, I showed you last time uh, a sequence that converges to square root of 2. Do you remember? It was defined like a n plus 1 is equal, oh, let's call it x, x n plus 1, that, that's how I did it last time, is 1 half x n minus 2 over x n. Or was it a plus? What was it? Oh, it was a plus, yes. It was a plus. And if we take, for example, x0 equal 2, and you iterate this, then this sequence will converge to square root of 2. But unfortunately, 
I mean, if you start with x0 equal 2, then all elements of the sequence are rational numbers. All elements of the sequence are rational numbers, but the limit is not a rational number. The limit does not exist if we just live in the rational numbers. And now, this is a nice trick. It's the same trick we used when we invented the rational numbers. The trick is we said, okay, the set of the real numbers is all the rational numbers plus all limits of sequences of rational numbers. We just add everything we do not have to our set. That's a nice thing in mathematics. If you if you're missing something, you just postulate and say, okay, we now have this, the rest too. Huh? Okay, so um, yeah, this was a kind of a little bit unexact. We add the limits of all converging sequences. But how can we talk about convergence of sequences in the rational numbers if we don't know the limits? We don't have the limits of our sequences in the rational numbers. So we cannot define the limits. And uh, since we cannot define the limits, we cannot prove that they converge because for convergence we need the limits. And now again you see how powerful this notions, notion of Cauchy sequence is. So what we actually do to create the real numbers is we take all Cauchy sequences of rational numbers huh, and add all the Cauchy sequences to our rational numbers. Huh? And as a... Um, uh, let's say as a compact representation of this Cauchy sequence, we just think of the limit. Yeah. yeah. And now uh, this theorem, uh, what was it, 5.6, is no longer a theorem. It is the definition of the set of real numbers. Okay. Let's, so now let's get back to our series. Um, okay, we have this Cauchy convergence criterion. Uh, okay, then there is this next nice theorem, a series with uh, positive, uh, all coefficients positive. Um, no, not all, uh, from a certain K on. For, no, for K, yeah, all, all, uh, sorry, all coefficients have to be positive. Convergence converges if the sequence of partial sums is bounded. So we just need um, this sequence to be bounded. Last time we saw a sequence converges <coughs> if all the elements or if the sequence is bounded and what did we need to? We need a second uh, condition. Yeah, it has to be monotonic. Huh? Here we don't need the monotonic anymore. Why? Because we see that it is monotonic. Why is it monotonic? Hmm? Yes, of course it's bounded, but we need the monotonicity too. Why, why, is, why is such a series monotonic? It's a sum. It is a sum, but not all sums are monotonic. Why is this sum monotonic? Because it's all positive. Yeah, because all the elements are positive. Thank you. Yeah. And if you add something positive, it only can, it can be bigger. Okay, yeah. 
And then there is the Majorant uh, crit criterion. Um, yeah, so if we have one convergent series, C with the uh, coefficient Cn, um, and all the coefficients are positive or greater than or equal to zero, and the second uh, sequence An uh, such that the absolute value of all the An is bounded by the Cn, so all the Cn are majors to the to the absolute An, then An converges to. And then this series with the Cn is, call, is called uh, uh, Majorant of our series with the An. Uh, okay, and then there is also the quotient criterion. Um, so we have one sequence. Uh, Let a and no, this has to be a series, of course. This is an, an error here. It must, it must, of course, be series. Um, with non zero um, elements. Yeah. Um, and we have a real number Q between 0 and 1 such that all the ratios of two successive elements, a n plus 1 divided by a n, absolutely is less than or equal to this number Q. Huh? And this Q has to be smaller than 1. That's important. Huh? Uh, so that means the the elements of our series, they decrease and that's not sufficient. It, it's not sufficient that they decrease. They have to decrease fast enough. And they have to decrease in a way such that the ratio of two successive elements is less than or equal to some fixed number Q for all n greater than or equal to n0. So, yeah, I mean, we have a couple of times already seen greater than or equal to n0. So this is not required for all n. It's just, uh, we just need it from a certain, from a certain index on. Why? So look, if we write our series sum k equals 0 to infinity a k, we can always write this as the sum over k equals 0 to, uh, what was it, greater than or equal to n0, yeah, to n0 minus 1 a k plus the rest of the sum, sum over k equal to n0 to infinity a k. It's always sufficient to talk about such an infinite rest of the sum. This is the initial part. This is a finite, a finite series with how many elements does it have? Um, it has n zero elements. Huh? And we can always neglect any finite um, initial part of the, of the series. Why? And it does not matter how large this n0 is. This may be one million, it may be a billion, it does not matter. Why? We are interested only in the right side. No, we are interested actually in the sum in everything. Of course this matters. But why can we, as long as we just talk about the question, does our series converge or not? 
with respect to this question, we can always neglect a finite initial part of the sum. Why? It's very much smaller than that. That's not sure. It may be much bigger than the rest. So in all of, so whenever we talk about convergence of a series we can always neglect any finite initial part why it doesn't matter for the convergence because it's just like an initial value it can yeah yeah it's just like an initial value yeah that's good yeah i mean if you take a finite sum, if it has a billion elements, it is finite. Any finite sum always is finite. That's trivial because I add, for example, one billion times something. Yeah? One billion, the sum of one billion finite things is finite. So this is finite for sure. The, the critical part which may be infinite is only this rest. Huh? And no matter how long this is, if our series is divergent, that means if the sum is not finite, then the infinite thing is always this rest here. No matter how long this is. That's very important. Is this clear now? I mean, look, if the whole thing is infinite, um, no matter how large this number is, what remains is infinite. If you subtract any finite number from infinity, then the rest is, Im is still uh, infinite. Okay, we were talking about the quotient criterion. Um, okay, so what we need here is that the ratio of two successive elements has to be smaller than a fixed number smaller than one. Huh? So, for example, if the ratio of two successive elements is smaller than 0.9, then our series converges. Huh? Um, the proof for this quotient criterion um, goes via the uh, no, uh, via the geometric series, uh, because in a geometric series, the ratio of two successive uh, elements is exactly uh, Q. Okay, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's look at this example here. Uh, <clears throat> we want to show that this series converges. Now look at the elements of this sum. n squared divided by 2 to the power n. So, I mean, do you have an idea whether this converges or not. Maybe we, you, you, can, you can also look at this series. Why does this not converge? It's very important for you to do exercises with sequences and series in order to get a feeling for what's going on. Why does this guy not converge? 
and you can immediately see this n equal to zero oh yeah ah, so, uh, okay sorry I'm sorry let it take n equal one and uh, yeah okay over there it's okay but this uh, still does not uh, converge but you're right it's not defined for n equal zero thank you but why can you how can we immediately see that there is no chance for this guy to converge uh, but the the uh, the numer numerator goes to infinity, uh, but the denominator too. The denominator grows much faster. Yeah, you're right. The denominator grows much faster. No, no, the 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 numerator grows much faster than the denominator. That's why even the elements of the series go to infinity I mean then there is no chance at all but I mean how about this sum uh, how about this guy now the enumerator and the denominator they go to infinity in the same speed. Oh, my, 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 let's make it easier. Uh, let's take n squared here and 100. So then we are sure it converges because the, the denominator is much bigger than the enumerator. Does it? Does it converge or not? Converge. Is he right? Do you believe him? <coughs> In mathematics we never believe. We prove ourselves. Huh? So how can you prove that this guy converges? Und? Also es konvergiert daher nicht, weil die Zahlen sind dann nicht mehr klein, das ist dann irgendwann geht es gegen 1 und man addiert dann immer 1. Was geht denn gegen 1? Nee, der Quotient ist ein Hundertstel. Da geht nichts gegen 1. Das kürzt sich raus und das ist ein Hundertstel. Da geht nichts gegen 1. Aber es geht nicht. Richtig, absolut richtig. Okay, so now let me translate what he said. So the second thing he said was right, the first thing now. Yeah? Okay, so he said uh, for n towards infinity, I mean, not, uh, this can just cancels out. So this is. Uh, the sum n equal 1 to infinity of 1 over 100. Okay? Um, and you can write this as 1 over 100 times the sum n equal 1 to infinity over 1. And now I hope all see it that this is an infinite sum of 1 which is infinite of course. So this of course does not converge huh? because it is the sum over a constant huh? so and what he said is for a sum in order to converge a necessary uh, but not sufficient condition a necessary condition for a series to converge is that the um, the elements of the sum, so the sequence of the elements has to be convergent to zero. Huh? So the limit of the sequence of the elements has to be zero. And now the question is, is the limit of this here, of these a n here, is the limit of this zero? No, of course not. It's infinity. 
Okay, now let's look at this view. What is the limit of these a n? So I'm not talking about the series. I'm just talking about the series of the elements in this sum. What is the limit of n squared divided by 2 to the power n? So let's write it down. What is the limit for n towards infinity of n squared divided to 2 power n? Always less than one. The whole term is always less than one. It's less than one, yes. That's nice to know. But what is the limit? What is the limit? You have to do a lot of exercises. That's really important. I mean, it's. I can understand that you are having some problems now, but in the next lecture you won't have these problems anymore if you do a lot of exercises with series and sequences. Okay, I tell you the limit is zero. My next question is how do you prove that this limit is zero? Have you ever heard of the rule of de L'Hopital? Yeah, you, you differentiate the enumerator and the denominator and then take the limit again and hopefully then you get a limit. If not, you differentiate it again both and that's what you should know from analysis one. Yeah? Uh, but there are other ways to prove this. I mean here you don't need de L'Hopital if you just know that this is an exponential function and this is only a polynomial, then you know that any exponential function for n towards infinity grows faster than any polynomial and then you know that this limit is zero. Huh? These are easy arguments, but please yeah, recall them in your mind or read it in your script or whatever, but the best way to, do, to learn this is with many exercises. Okay, so there was a bell ringing. Looks like uh, we are finished now. Okay, thank you.